in starting of engineering education in india so many people mm -hmm. do visit there is a aqueduct here very nearby and people do visit and take photographs of that aqueduct because this is that is 1840 s aqueduct okay so that canal when canal was being built and generally canal canal as far as i know uh, in some of the places the canal is mostly dig out we have to take out the soil to make the canal but here because of the unequal nature of the terrain actually the, the soil had to brought in from other places and it was impounded and then canal was made and uh, at these places actually lot of problem happened during the making of that canal so lot of engineering aspects and other things were applied and also because it is just very nearby to himalayas so we have we have a uh, lot of uh, rainy rivers that that have lot of flow during the rainy season so because of that the embankment actually used to run off every season so that was a very challenging to make a stable canal which should be stable for longer duration and it should work properly during all seasons so that was so we have all the three types of systems where one place is one at one place river is below the canal another place the river is above and at third place they are at equal level also all the three types okay. of systems where one place is one at one place river is below the canal another place the river is above and at third place they are at equal level also all the three types okay. of systems where one place is one at one place river is below the canal another place the river is above and at third place they are at equal level also all the three types okay. of systems where one place is one at one place river is below the canal another place thank you so can uh, sorry i i i have to go back now i'm, I'm back for sekasler no problem yeah vimal are you there i am here i am here can we start now i think yes yes please start please start so okay asis yeah please start yeah so uh, a very warm good evening to everyone so respected uh, honorable director professor chaturvedi our eminent speaker professor kasler and professor shivastav and my dear colleagues so i welcome uh, you all to the third edition of uh, professor jbilal memorial lecture that is been initiated as a tribute to our founding head of the chemical engineering department and to take it further i would like to request professor shushil kumar to say few words about our department yeah professor shushil kumar yeah, please thank you thank you professor asis and uh, good afternoon everyone so i'm going to talk about uh, uh, about my our department the department of chemical engineering it roorkee so let me let me share some some slides i will go through about the department through these slides Okay, can I share this screen? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So this one, right? This is not working. So save him. Right. Yeah, come no, on. No. I don't see that one.
Okay. Yeah, I'm doing this full size. So So is it useful? Okay, um, it's fine. Okay, so uh, good afternoon again. Uh, uh, myself, Dr. Susil Kumar. I'm a student professor in Cambridge Department. So I, I welcome you all. So uh, let's talk about our department, which is Department of Chemical Engineering and, uh, at IIT Roorkee. So, so we started our department in 1963 uh, with with our bachelor programs. And the master program started uh, on 1970, seven years after we started our bachelor program. And then our first PhD student, which was graduated uh, in 1972. And in 1977, we, uh, we, di we diversified our master program. So we started a few uh, different master program track. And uh, in, in 2003, we also started dual degree. So we take um, bachelor degree as well as the master degree combined. And uh, we celebrated our 50, 50 years of our establishment in 2013. So that was our golden jubilee celebration. And in 2018, we, we, uh, we thought to combine all the different master program into a single master program in chemical engineering. So moving ahead uh, about our department profile, so if I if I see uh, the world ranking, or if I compare the chemical engineering department within India, so IIT Roorkee chemical engineering department ranked seventh as per Times Higher Education ranking 2020, and it is ranked eighth as per QS rankings 2020. And currently we are uh, 24 faculty members plus one emeritus faculty member. And uh, if we talk about uh, number of students which we are which our department is catering at the moment so we have around 89 phd students in this department and uh, our our bachelor students in the first year bachelor students in year 2020 is around 190 we are also uh, we are also uh, teaching polymer science and engineering uh, bachelor program which has a strength of 36 students and we also have a five year integrated dual degree program uh, so that's the optional one. So right now we only have one student in that program. And then we are running the master program in chemical engineering that has around 22 students enrolled in that program. Uh, now, if I talk about the major research trust, which our department is currently running, or we are doing uh, our experimental or research studies. So what, so what we are trying is uh, we're trying to focus almost all the are uh, all the th major th research thrust areas in chemical engineering in chemical engineering areas so uh, i can cut i can divide all this into mainly the four category that can be transfer process in energy and environment process engineering and advanced materials and we have our uh, we have our colleagues who are working on uh, almost in all this the different four at uh, four categories or four research areas uh, so if I talk about the transport uh, transfer process, uh, we are working on complex fluids and rheology, uh, multi-phase flow, granular materials, etc. Uh, if I talk about the energy and environment, we are doing, uh, uh, we are working or we are doing research in wastewater treatment or waste to energy or developing new sustainable processes using uh, biomass as well as uh, uh, different agriculture or forest biomass residues. Uh, we are also working on fuel cells, energy storage. And if I talk about the process engineering, uh, our colleague, they are working in the process integration, optimizations, design modeling and simulation, uh, CO2 conversion into chemicals, uh, catalysis synthesis, and so on. Uh, about the advanced material section, we are working on molecular simulations, materials from 
uh, nanomaterials, biomaterials, biocomposites, drug delivery, etc. So uh, what I want, I want to say is we are covering almost all the major research area in the chemical engineering field in our department. And if you talk about our government initiative, uh, uh, so we are actually flowing quite some government initiative uh, through our research profile, uh, namely Make in India, Swasth Bharat, Swachh Bharat, Namami Gange, Startup India and Digital India. So we are developing some MOC and NEPTEL courses. And not only we are uh, we are concentrating in ourselves, but we are also collaborating with our external partners by by signing MOV with uh, with different universities around the world. And uh, I I just uh, I have just written some of the some of the universities from where we have MOV. And we are also uh, doing research collaborations. Uh, our faculties they are they are involved in research collaboration with uh, with the different universities around the world. And some of the names I have uh, I've mentioned here. And if I talk about the achievements, uh, uh, so our faculties they have uh, they have I mean our our hard work have have been recognized by. Uh, by getting award from from various organizations or institutions, for example, CSI, R, Niri, Chemcon Distinguished Speaker Award was given uh, in 2019. We have fellow ISCHE members. Uh, we, our faculty colleagues were awarded with INE Young Engineers Award, INSA Young Scientist Award, etc. Uh, so as you said that uh, we not only uh, take pride of our faculty's achievement but we also do take pride in our our uh, students achievements and as you can see that uh, our students are not that far uh, behind in terms of achievements with respect to our faculty colleagues so our students have uh, have on several awards uh, which i have tried to mention some of them or highlighted some of the achievements by our students naming erection innovation award 2017 uh, Essential Innovation Challenge 2017, and so many more. So moving ahead, uh, um, so uh, we are not only focusing on uh, fundamental uh, research, but we are also trying to develop new technology or new process that can be uh, that can be commercialized or taken by industry uh, to to uh, to solve our uh, our uh, actual or the practical problems or the problems faced by our society and and the nature. And that is reflected by uh, by the several uh, technology and process developed in our department. So I'm just to mention some of the technology which we have which we have developed here. For example, uh, a process of solid acid polymerization of polylactic acid was developed, and PLA was manufactured by a by a Delhi, uh, Delhi based form. And we also developed uh, uh, remo and removal of radioactive iodine. And and few more processes. Um, and then we, uh, as you can see, that we have filed several patents, which ma which manifest our uh, uh, our our technology based uh, research, or let's say pro process technology development based based research. So you can see that we have we have filed several patents. And uh, as you know that uh, for for any research. We need we need to have uh, sufficient uh, infrastructure to carry out all the research work. And luckily, in our department, uh, we have all the major equipments which is required to to successfully carry out uh, uh, all the research work which we have mentioned in different uh, chemical engineering research areas. For example, we have HPLC, uh, we have TGI, FTIR, we have GCMS. Yeah, you name it. Uh, uh, we have. It's likely that we have that equipment available in our chemical engineering department. And apart from that, of course, we need funding to to carry out all the research work. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have uh, received quite generous funding from various uh, government as well as non-government organizations. So I have just mentioned some of uh, some of the fundings or grants which we have rec we received recently. Um, so, so not we also do take pride a lot of take pride in our distinguished faculty, also uh, distinguished alumni. I'm I'm just mentioning uh, some of our distinguished alumni here. So Sanjeev Singh, it's he was uh, 
he was chair he was chairman of iocl so it's um it's one of the biggest uh, oil refinery in india and uh, he was the chairman of that uh, we have uh, rasmi barma uh, she is she, uh, she, um, she is in charge of map my india so it's a uh, india homegrown based um, it's a uh, map mapping uh, mapping company and then we have Saurabh Agrawal, who is the CFO of Tata Sons. And there are some uh, other distinguished alumni, which you can see here. So last but not the least, uh, our main strength lies in our students. And we take pride in nurturing the best talents in the country. So with that, uh, with that I thank you for, for listening. And uh, I, I give... Uh, I ask Professor Asis to please move with the proceedings. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Kumar, for the introduction about our department. So, now I would like to invite uh, head of our department, Professor Shivastav, to uh, sort of few, uh, say a few words about our uh, uh, Professor J.B. Lal. Okay, so Professor Shivastav. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Vimal, you are not audible. Okay, okay. So, uh, pro, pro, it is my proud privilege to speak about Professor Jagraj Bihari Lal, who was our founder head of the department at IIT Roorkee uh, from 1966, July, January 1966 to July 1969. Uh, Professor Lal was born on January 15, 1910, and he obtained his BSc honors, MSc chemistry, and doctoral degree from Allahabad University in the year 1931-32 and 1939, respectively. He joined HBTI Kanpur as research assistant in 1939. Later, he did Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Chemical Engineering from University of Michigan in, uh, in the year 1948 and 1950, respectively. And uh, he, he was the uh, one of the good students of Professor G. G. Brown who is a legendary figure in the chemical engineering. And uh, so he was very fortunate to have worked with Professor G.G. Brown at University of Michigan. After his study at University of Michigan, he was appointed as industrial chemist uh, by the government of Uttar Pradesh in 1950, 1950. He also served as industrial advisor and directorate of industries at Kanpur, which was a big hub of industries at that time. He uh, later on he served as professor and head department of chemical engineering HBTI Kanpur during 1958 to 1956, uh, 1966. During his career, he has published more than 85 papers on pure chemistry and chemical technology. He was elected as an associate member of Royal Institute of Chemistry of Great Britain and Ireland in 1944. He was elected as a professional member of Chemical Institute of Canada, Ottawa, in 1947. And he was also elected member of Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers in 1953. Uh, he was awarded the gold medal by the Oil Technologists Association of India in 1962 for the meritorious work done in the field of oil technology. Uh, he was also awarded the Rai Bahadur Mahanarayan Memorial Gold Medal in 1962 and Jaipuriya Gold Medal in 1963. Uh, Professor Lal joined as founder head of the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Roorkee in January 1966 to establish the newly created Chemical Engineering Department. During his tenure at Roorkee, he accomplished uh, various uh, tasks which included uh, uh, starting of six weeks projects implanting training to the students. He developed all the basic infrastructure, including laboratories, utility sections, library, classrooms, offices, etc. everything in the department. Uh, he enhanced the faculty strength also, so as to boost the academic environment and initiate the research. And uh, in, 
the research that started during time, uh, uh, his time also, we, uh, the first PhD was awarded in 1972. He served the department till July 1969 and uh, joined the HBTI Kanpur uh, thereafter. On 30th of November 1969, he left for heavenly adobe during uh, meditation in a temple. So Professor Lal was a simple, honest, hardworking person. He believed in work in worship principle. He used to tirelessly uh, work all throughout the day till dark in the evening. He was a religious person and he never had any prejudice against anyone. Even his bitter critics of that time always held him as a man of integrity and absorbed, uh, who was always absorbed in academics. So in short, he was a very noble soul. And it is due to his visionary outlook and statementships and distinctive personality that the Department of Chemical Engineering IIT Rurki bloomed as one of the best centers of chemical engineering education in India and also abroad. And we at Department of Chemical Engineering are all indebted to him for his efforts and vision. And we foresee to carry, a, carry his vision forward and make our department one of the best department in the country as well as in the globe. So thank you. So, yeah, thank you, Professor Shivasta, for uh, introducing Professor J.B. Lal. And now I would uh, like to request uh, our honorable director, sir, Professor Chaturvedi, to say a few words. Yeah, Professor Chaturvedi. Uh, Professor Kastler, Professor Shivasta, Professor Yadav, Professor Kumar, and my colleagues in the Department of Chemical Engineering, students uh, who are listening to this address. I think I will start by congratulating the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering that it has established such a wonderful tradition to have this annual memorial lecture series to honor the founding head, Professor J.B. Lal. It started uh, with the lecture by Professor Devang Khakkar in 2018. And then we had a lecture by Professor uh, G.D. Yadav in the next year, which was followed by Professor M.M. Sharma. And now we are fortunate to have Professor Kastler delivering the fourth edition of this lecture. Uh, they are all very distinguished scientists and engineers who have uh, made great accomplishments in their profession. And it's an honor and privilege to listen to such personalities. And I'm sure that the entire audience will benefit a lot from the vision and from the insights uh, that uh, Professor Kessler is going to share today. Uh, the purpose of this lecture series when, he, when they were initiated in every department and center of the institute was to make sure that uh, we are able to invite some very good eminent personalities into the campus. Uh, we spend time with them. They also look at our facilities, look at our research, interact with our faculty and students, get to know whatever good is happening in IIT Rurki and then they can spread the good word uh, when they go back to their respective places. And similarly, when they come here, their pearls of wisdom, whatever things that they notice, whatever advice that they give, they can be very, very useful uh, for each one of us. And so it is always good to have some very distinguished people visiting the campus and delivering lectures. COVID-19 brought a break in this exercise uh, because uh, travel became limited. And uh, so we could not invite uh, people physically to the campus, but I'm happy that the department has uh, used this opportunity to invite uh, somebody who would otherwise normally would not have come visited the country because uh, it would involve a lot of logistics and exercise. But Professor Kessler, uh, we were able to get hold of him because now we are holding these online lecture series. So thank you, Professor Kessler, that you have agreed to deliver this talk so early in the morning. Although you said that the morning is pleasant, but still we thank you. We thank you profusely for accepting our like, uh, invitation and agreeing to deliver this, uh, this lecture. We look forward to hearing to Professor Kessler today evening. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Director, uh, Professor Chaturvedi, so for his nice words. So uh, now uh, I would like to invite Professor Oja to uh, so sort of introduce Professor Kessler. So, Professor Poja, please. Thank you, Ashish. 
Uh, good evening. It's great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker of the evening to talk to us about the future of chemical engineering teaching. This is a subject of utmost importance at the time when education is evolving from a specialization to multidisciplinary. We could not have anyone better than Professor Edward L. Kessler Jr. to talk about the topic. Professor Kessler is working uh, currently working as distinguished institute professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota. He served as director, vice president, and president of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. He has obtained his B honors from Yale University in 1961, and subsequently his MS and PhD in chemical engineering from University of Wisconsin, 1963 and 1960. During his PhD, he was guided by Professor Ian Lightfoot, who is well known for his contribution to the transport phenomena. And one of the co-author of Transport Phenomena book, that is, uh, Bird, uh, along with Stewart and Bird. After his PhD, Professor Kessler joined Carnegie Mellon University, and after working there for 13 years, he moved to University of Minnesota in 1980. Professor Kessler has authored over 250 articles and five books, which includes diffusion, bioseparations, and more specific chemical product design. Kessler has received the Colburn and Davis Award and the Institute Lecture. From the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, uh, the Separation Science Award from the American Chemical Society, the, the Merrifield Design Award from the American Society uh, of Engineering Education, and honorary degree from the University of Lund and Nancy. Professor Kessler is a fellow of American Association for the Advance of Science and a member of National Academy of Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, blind me in welcoming Professor Edward Kessler Jr. Thank you. So I'm unmuted. Is that okay? No, Ed, you are okay. Okay. Can I have the first slide, please? Yes, sir. It's getting there. Good. Um, thank you for having me. I, I am delighted to be here partly because of the history of your university. The idea that the university started specifically to improve transportation, that it grew from civil engineering, is very similar to engineering education in the United States. Uh, engineering education in the United States began only 10 years before your institution, and was again aiming at standards for canals. It was, uh, it was not chemicals, it was canals and railroads. And that led to the entire organization of engineering, the licensure and so forth of engineering. I must also thank you because I'm delighted to follow uh, Professor M.M. M. Sharma. I love Sharma. I love fighting with Sharma. And what always impresses me is when you're finished fighting, Sharma just giggles a little bit, and then you're wonderful friends. Uh, so, so I'm very honored to follow him in this lecture series. And I thank you also for telling me about Professor Lal, who ironically shares exactly the same birthday as my father, who was also a, a very chemical engineer, a, a chemical engineer, not distinguished in any way, but, but a wonderful man as well. Now to the lecture. Um, the first thing to remember is that research is important, but for me, 85 to 90 percent of my students stop their education with a bachelor's degree. And I think there's a tendency to spend my intellectual time and energy on research, which is not inappropriate. But I want to make sure that we prepare students for a 40-year career. When they leave us, 
most of our students will spend 40 years, productive years, hopefully, developing what we have taught them. And we want to make sure what we have taught them is appropriate for the next 40 years. In the same way, if you go back to the origins of your institution, what you taught, what was taught to those students, railroads, canals, and so forth, was exactly important for the society that they then had. But what we're teaching now, while appropriate for the next 10 years, may not be as appropriate for the next 40 years. And so we need to think carefully about how we expect the needs of society, which our students must try to fulfill, what those needs are. And to do that, I want to talk first about what is the scope of what we teach, what is the content, and how will that content change in the future. So to begin with the scope, um, I like to ride, go ahead, that's good, Deepak. I like to ride bicycles and uh, I like strenuous physical exercise every day. But since I'm now over 80 years old, it's harder and harder for me to find people my age to ride with. So I, I ride with younger people and I need every way I can think of to get them to slow down. And so I try to, to design questions which will have long answers. And maybe if they're talking that much, I can keep up with them on my bicycle. And one intriguing uh, example of this came from, I was riding with a professor of sociology who was interested especially in the sociology of fairy tales and how that led to countries. And he argued, I thought the idea was, new, was or original with him, but it certainly is broadly subscribed to. He said that the interesting question is to ask what makes a country? And the model of making a country is Germany. That as you remember, 150 years ago, Germany did not exist as a country. Rather, it was a collection of perhaps 80 small countries. And the reason that Germany came, became a country the sociology, sociology professor asserted, was because it had two things, poetry and grammar. It had a common emotional core. And that common emotional core was supplied by the poet Goethe, whose picture is shown on the left. And Goethe was born about 1780, I've forgotten exactly. So you're talking more than a couple hundred years old. And Goethe gave the German speaking people a common legend around which to, to organize. Everyone read Goethe, everyone knew about Faust. Everything was common, that was the common thread that supplied sort of the imagination. Now, the second part of this comes from Jakob Grimm. I, I don't know, it's hard for me with this format to, to ask you specifically about this, but I suspect many of you read fairy tales growing up. And in Europe, the fairy tales were organized and codified by two brothers named Grimm. And Grimm, Jacob Grimm, also wrote the first German grammar about how the language was put together. And the reason that this is interesting for this talk is that Grimm, while he codified the language, Grimm actually did not speak German. He spoke Swabian. He was from a different part of Germany where German was not spoken. But if you have these two people supplying poetry, the imagination, and grammar, the structure of the language, you can use that as the basis for a country. And now I want you to ask you to think about 
what would happen if you tried to find poetry and grammar for engineering, specifically chemical engineering? May I have the next slide, please? You can think of the poetry, if you like, as being the science, and you can think of the grammar as being the engineering. So the poetry and the grammar that you seek will allow you to define a discipline, will allow you to say what belongs in chemical engineering. The next one. I would suggest that you think about what makes chemical engineering, and I would suggest that this comes from two people. Mendeleev, remember the suggester of the periodic table when he was 30, 33 years old, Mendeleev was the youngest of 14 children. Actually, his parents really weren't ever certain <clears throat> about how many children they had, which always <laughs> impresses me. Uh, they lived in Siberia. They lived a very simple life. And, and I think they often had children who were born and died quickly and so forth. So they really didn't, they weren't completely sure about the number that they should have. They also took in children who were orphaned and so forth. But Mendeleev is believed to be the 14th child. And his, his suggestion of a periodic table gave an intellectual poetry to chemistry as a whole. It told you how you can approach chemistry. In the same way, Arthur D. Little, who was an American, ran a board in 1917 that codified chemical engineering. It gave it a structure, a grammar, and that structure was very clear in what you presented about your department. Little's structure was unit operations. It was basically saying that if you distill um, alcohol and if you distill petroleum, the analysis of those two processes is to a first approximation independent of what they are. All distillation is the same. And, and we don't even think about that anymore. But we must understand that in 1917, this was a controversial organization. Now, if you have these parts of chemical engineering, where do you go from here, Deepak? <clears throat> If you have the poetry and grammar, you now must ask yourself, how is this content taught? And there are two ways in which you can teach, and you can, each of you who has taught, will recognize these two ways. The next one. The first of the ways, I think, is associated with, with uh, John Calvin. And we're in this way now, because it's hard for you to talk back to me. I mean, you're, you're muted and I'm not. So, so I am in Calvin's style, the foundation of all knowledge. And Calvin, who was a religious fanatic, um, certainly believed that his word was the re revealed word of God. Uh, he believed that anyone who disagreed with him was seriously wrong. Um, he, he once had Michael Servetus, who was the equivalent of a Calvin's graduate student, come to him complaining that Calvin was overly prescriptive about Christianity overall. And uh, Calvin had him burned at the stake. I mean, you may have thought of doing this of one of your graduate students just executing them promptly because they weren't doing very well. But that's basically what Calvin did. <clears throat> he thought he knew the answer. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that often, I'm afraid, is the way we teach. We do not allow for any deviation in terms of what is being said. Now, in some cases, you know, that makes excellent sense. In some cases, friction factors are always going to be the same. But in other cases, it may be there are alternative ways to look at problems that we should think of. Uh, I would, for example, suggest you think about applying a fanning friction factor to the roughness of a piece of sandpaper. 
and you discover very quickly you need to generate a different kind of analysis for a different problem. And that one's perfectly clear, but in other cases it won't be. The alternative to Calvin's way of teaching is that of Socrates. Uh, this, of course, is, is a Renaissance bust. It, there's no evidence that Socrates looked anything like this. But what Socrates argued was that you needed to have a discussion of what the ideas involved were. And by having that discussion, uh, you could, you could uh, go much further into a true understanding of what was happening. So remember, Calvin is you and I, we're the professors. We know exactly what is correct. And we tell the students, knowledge transfer is one way. But Socrates had knowledge being transferred back and forth. To me, this is most clearly shown by the painting by Raphael, which is in the Vatican on the next slide. Now, this painting has been slightly modified. You see the two central figure, features. If you look in the background, you realize there's chemical processing going on, which certainly wasn't in Raphael's original poem, painting. And if you look over in the upper left, you see carved on one of the columns, urea, and you're right, this is made by a company that makes urea. They modified this picture. And if you look at the people in the figures, you see that they've got laptops and they've got um, blueprints and, and uh, they're all learning, they're arguing, they're, they are just all um, trying to learn in different sorts of ways. The woman dressed in white, in the right foreground is Hypaxia of Alexandria, who was in the third century AD, was a major mathematician in Alexandria in northern Egypt. So what Raphael's trying to do is just look at how many different ways there are to learn. I mean, this looks like the coffee hour after a seminar, doesn't it? Everybody's arguing about different sorts of things. And the idea that you can get to the truth by a number of routes is important. The two central figures, the man in the center in the yellow hard hat, that's, uh, that is said to be Plato. Uh, Plato was one of Socrates' graduate students. And the man directly to the right of Plato in the blue hard hat is Aristotle, the foundation of most of ancient scientific teaching. So which way do we want to teach? And I would argue that we want to teach in this dialogue way, this chaotic way. To a certain extent, we have to start with what we know, what we believe to be most often true. But we also want to look at what can happen in any different way of gaining knowledge. Next. For example, if you're going to show these ideas, I think you need to think about ways that go beyond the math that we normally present. Do any of you know about a feather and guinea tube? This is an 18th century device. You have a piece of pipe, and in the piece of pipe, you have a coin, uh, a guinea, and a feather. And of course, if you turn this over, uh, you see the feather drifting down slowly, but the coin just drops right away, it just goes down right away with a thump. You show, show the students this experiment and they'll look bored. If you then pull a vacuum on the tube and again invert the tube, the guinea, of course, falls, the coin falls right down to the other end, but the feather does as well. I've never seen students' mouths drop open to the same degree as when they see the feather drop like a stone. And what that does is very quickly make a point about friction factors, make a point about areas, densities, and so forth that cannot be made <clears throat> without that demonstration. I think this, <clears throat> this is the most effective demonstration you can have. To take a second example, one of my graduate students, next one please, 
one of my graduate students once wondered if if you swam in syrup if you just had a sugar syrup and you'd swam in the in the sugar syrup would you go faster or slower and so we made the experiment i've never made such a stupid experiment or one that was more fun in my life we filled a small swimming pool full of a uh, syrup that had a viscosity of about twice that of water and we had uh, swimmers get into the uh, pool and swim and the swimmers ranged from the ones on the extreme left who were basically olympic level swimmers and me i'm one of the ones the yellow points more towards the left of this diagram and as you can see the relative speed in the guar syrup versus the speed in water is unchanged with viscosity now why should that be uh, why should that be why should the speed not change and of course the reason is that when you're swimming in a swimming pool the friction is form drag it's not viscous drag and your reynolds number is way up in the area of hundreds of thousands and so under that region the friction factor is a constant independent of the viscosity now i once talked about this in detail to to an audience of biologists and the audience included some nobel laureates and one of the nobel laureates said to me right away after my talk what would happen for a microorganism? And of course, that was exactly the question to ask. I had never thought of that. I'm very sorry I didn't make that experiment. Because if you think a microorganism, roughly 100,000 times smaller than you and I, the microorganism's Reynolds number is going to be down well below one. And so for the microorganism, one would expect the velocity to drop. I've never made the experiment. I've always been tempted, and I've never done it. So again, I suggest that these demonstrations are exactly what you need to drive home the active lecturing, the form suggested by Socrates. Go ahead, Deepak. So that suggests first the grammar and the poetry. Remember, the grammar that's how you organize your thinking in the poetry. That's how you dream. That's how you jump ahead. And now, what is the, how is the, the, the uh, material taught? You can teach it where you are the sage on a stage where you perform, but the knowledge transfer only goes one way. Or you can think about the dialogue that Socrates encourages. Now shift to what the future content will be. Now, what I have taught and what I suspect from the list of research topics that you gave, what you have taught, this implies large dedicated facilities. This is the BAS plant, BASF plant in Northern Germany, the largest chemical complex in the world. And the reason it's so big is because per mass, making more product is cheaper. So that's the reason why you have this enormous chemical plant. And next slide, please. The same sort of thing applies to our course content. The classic textbook in chemical engineering is the Walker Lewis and McAdams textbook from 1923. And I urge each of you to look at this textbook carefully. Because if you look at the textbook, the content, the chapters, the list of the chapters is the same as the list of courses that we offer. That's not completely true. For example, few chemical engineering departments teach crushing and grinding anymore. I don't know if yours does. Mine does not. Uh, but otherwise, the content of the chapters, of course, the details of catalysis, are completely different than they were in 1923. 
but the basic course structure is the same. It really is the same. So now, if you have that structure, how is that going to supply today's students and how will it supply students in the future? Go ahead, please. If you think about what the, I've reorganized this deliberately. I mean, I haven't talked about reactions. I haven't talked about separations. I haven't talked about process control because I want to step back from the way in which we make chemicals and think about whether we're going to do this in 40 years, the professional lifetime of our students. And if you look at the contents of our classes, reorganized now into a more contemporary form, for energy, the United States chemical business rests on fossil fuels, especially petroleum. So for energy, we are going to exploit the energy in fossil fuels. In food, we're going to exploit the, we're going to exploit the possibilities provided by fertilizer. Um, as you know, fertilizer depends on ammonia and on a urea. Uh, ammonia and urea are very important for increasing food supplies. Uh, ammonia and urea are made based primarily on the Haber-Bosch process. I, I point out to you that one half, at least one half, perhaps 80% of the nitrogen atoms in your body and in my body have run through the Haber-Bosch process. In other words, that is responsible not only for feeding the world, but also for our well-being. For clothing, the obvious thing to think about is polymers. You had a number, for example, the polylactic acid, a very attractive alternative that not so much for clothing, but to reduce pollution, plastic pollution. And finally, for health, I remind you that chemical engineering is responsible for the production of antibiotics, which takes place largely by fermentation. The first antibiotic was penicillin. The first patient who received penicillin died. And the reason he died is because they ran out of penicillin. And the reason they ran out of penicillin was because no one knew how to make a submersible culture productive. And that came directly from our profession. Now, if you look at the future for this, what is the future going to be? And here we have to speculate. So this is where I want you to go beyond me. I'm going to give you opinions, but I am now much more like Socrates than I am like John Calvin, because I don't know if my answers are right. Go ahead. <clears throat> First of all, the energy is relatively easy. We're going to have to give up on fossil fuels and go to sun and wind. Um, it's astonishing to me that in western Minnesota, in the central part of the United States, electric power per kilowatt hour is one eighth of the cost of electric power in New York City, because in Minnesota, the electric power is made from wind. So a factor of eight is unheard heard of in the chemical industry, a factor of eight in price. And so I suggest this is going to be a major input and our students are going to need to be ready for that. In food, I think that the real issue in food in my society, I don't think this is true for India, but in North America, the issue with food is the fact that a cow is 7% efficient. In other words, it takes 15 pounds of protein feed to make one pound of beef. I cannot imagine another part of the chemical business where a critical step is only 7% efficient. In clothing, I think actually we're in fairly good shape. I think 
we can extend uh, polymers and product design. I think what we're teaching there probably is going to continue to be relevant. And, and so I'm less worried about that than the other areas. And in health, <clears throat> we're all very obsessed with the COVID pandemic at the moment, but we should pay attention to the public health officials who are saying that it's accidental that this pandemic came from viruses, that a pandemic from microbes, which are antibiotic resistant, was more likely and almost certainly will occur in the future. So how do you act on these? Energy is easy. So let's look at that one first. We can see what energy is going to happen. At the moment, there is, go ahead, please. At the moment, there's an enormous effort on electric cars. And um, I'm very impressed with Norway in this regard. Norway, which has its own oil resources, has decided that oil is too valuable to burn. And they simply are going to use that as a petrochemical feedstock. Um, their electric cars are, have a greater percentage of cars are electric in Norway. In part, that's because hydroelectricity is so cheap in Norway. So that may be wrong. Clearly, there's an enormous initiative in the United States now with the new administration to go electric to, to cars. That is the major source of of um, or a major source of um, renewable ener of energy use. And it's one we certainly need to address, but it's by no means the only one. Uh, if we look further than electric cars, and this is the area on which I work with DPAC. Next slide, please. Um, the idea of using wind energy can be made more vivid if you look at what happens where Deepak and I worked in western Minnesota. And we worked in the center of the country, very near the Continental Divide. Now, when I say this to Americans, they say that's nonsense. The Continental Divide exists in the Rocky Mountains. West of the Rocky Mountains, the flow of rain is to the Pacific and east it's to the Atlantic. That's true. But there's a second continental divide. And that continental divide is in the center of the country. It is the divide between the Arctic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, between the Arctic and the Atlantic. And that continental divide means, because it's clearly not mountainous, that continental divide means that we have enormous wind resources coming down directly from the Arctic that are extremely reliable, but we have no way in which to convert that energy into a form that could be used in the large cities on the East Coast or the West Coast. So how you convert this energy into a portable form is a major technical problem. Uh, the aspect of, of this that we worked on was making ammonia. If you look at the next slide, you get a little taste of this. Um, the place where this alternative energy source is first going to become uh, most generally useful is in sh ocean shipping. Uh, the expectation, the boats that are being built at the moment, uh, especially by the Japanese and the Chinese, those are going to be fueled with liquid ammonia, not gasoline, not natural gas, but liquid ammonia. And this is what this graph illustrates. There'll be some boats that are running on batteries, but those are relatively. So handles energy. What about the second aspect? What about food? Um, I know that, that uh, again, with a vegetarian society, this is not as immediate for you, but one of the chemical engineering breakthroughs of the last couple of years is to make hamburgers, gr nominally ground beef, out of completely vegetable feedstocks. One of the major companies for doing this is called Impossible Foods. 
They make an impossible burger, a hamburger, which to me doesn't taste the same as a regular hamburger. It tastes better. The key to this is the flavor. And the flavor comes from a genetically modified microorganism designed to produce molecules that are primarily responsible for the flavor of beef. And so basically you have ground vegetable with a genetically fermented flavor tasting better than beef. It's also cheaper. It has lower cholesterol and so is believed to be better for you. It is absolutely an astonishing innovation. Um, if you have a chance to, to eat this stuff, please try. It's, it's remarkable to, to eat it, to see what it tastes like. So that's something for food. Now, the next question, I want to give you your own demonstration. I want you, while you're seated, to, watch, to listen to this lecture, I want you to take your fingers and with one hand, maybe feel your, your clothes and another, feel your skin. Just try feeling, and you notice right away that they feel different. That's no surprise, right? But if you look at your fingers, you'll discover that, first of all, you almost always use a periodic motion. I'm very frustrated because if I were in the same room, I'd walk around to you now and ask you to make these motions. You'll, you notice that in order to feel different things, you, you actually go back and forth with your fingers at the same speed. And so if you have a different feeling, that different feeling does not come from speed, does it? It comes from the force. You're changing the force, both the normal force and the surface force, the force parallel to the surface. You're changing those two forces in order to get that difference in feeling. If we understood that, we would have the possibility of making clothing which had different feel. We could make clothing with the same polymer that had completely different feel. We could eliminate weaving. Uh, I remind you that, that in the middle of the um, 18th century, India exported to Britain a huge amount of cloth. And 100 years later, roughly the same amount of cloth went from England to India. And the reason was that the English mastered weaving mechanically. I think you could reverse that trade again if you began thinking about either food or clothing and how you would engineer consumer reactions. This means that chemical engineering now starts to exploit the interface with psychology as it has begun to exploit the interface between chemical engineering and biology. So that's the second thing. And then finally, on drug design. I'm going to skip this, Deepak. Let's go to the next one. This is the famous Menard plot, a civil engineer just about, well, within 10 years of the foundation of your university, a civil engineer named Charles Minard, working in France, drew this graph of Napoleon's march on Moscow. And you can see that the yellow line is his march starting on the left-hand side. That's the invasion. And he marches across to Moscow. Moscow is on the extreme right-hand side. There's a little red dot right above Moscow. Napoleon began his march with 470,000 men. And he marched, and as you remember, the cliche that I was taught in history class was he was beaten not by the Russians, but by General Winter. Everybody ran out of food and froze to death by the time they got to Moscow. And then the black line is his retreat. And you can see the black line gets thinner and thinner as he marches back. 
go back. I still want the same slide for a little more. Please, Deepak. Nope. Nope. Back, back. Napoleon marched with 472,000 men. And he came home. I won't go back. <laughs> That's all right. I'll do it in words. He came home. There it is. He came home with 4,900. In other words, of every 1,000 men, he lost nine, over 990. Now, what's interesting about this is, by the standards of the drug business, Napoleon's campaign was a success. In other words, in the drug business, if you have more than one successful drug from a 1,000 drugs, you're, you're better than average. This to me is an opportunity for exactly this sort of molecular simulation which you described in the summary of, of research topics for your department. In other words, can chemical engineers undertake drug design as a form of drug discovery and improve on this terrible inefficiency? I understand this is a major problem. I understand many people have tried to do this. I understand that they have failed. But I think not many chemical engineers have tried, and I think they may bring skills which are less understood in other areas of science, especially medicine. Okay, go ahead. Next slide, please. So what, I've, what have I suggested? Let's go back one if you can do it. Um, the summary is, what is the content? Think about the grammar and the poetry. What is your intellectual idea? I think the periodic table is what you want to stay with. What is your grammar, your structure of organizing this? Here, it's not clear that continuing to organize around unit operations is always going to be the right aspect. That needs to be rethought. How is the content taught? I'm very impressed in the brief times where I've lectured in Indian universities. I'm very impressed with the discipline and hard work of both faculty and students. But I have been concerned that there is not enough dialogue. There certainly is not enough dialogue in my university in Minnesota. We need to talk. We need to teach advanced material, especially using the ideas of Socrates not the dicta of, not the demanding of one answer suggested by John Calvin. And what will the future be? Well, the future will be, we still got to take care of the chemical process industries. I'm not arguing for abandoning that. The list of research topics that you gave to me is a very sensible one. But I think also we need to dream about the future. How do we make energy sustainable? How do we make drug design efficient? How do we make clothes? How do we make non-woven clothes, cheaper clothes without weaving? I hope that each of you will carry that through. And again, look at my students, the next slide. If I look back at my students, these are guys that I actually remember seeing at eight o'clock every morning for two years. If I look at them, I prepared them for the chemical industry based on petrochemicals. How should I prepare them for the industry that they will be working in in 30 years? Thank you for listening. Skip these. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Gessler, for a very uh, wonderful talk. And now we have time for a few questions from the audience and they can interact with Professor Kessler. So yeah, any of the audience, any questions from audience? Yeah, uh, interested audience, uh, they can post their questions in the chat box.
I have a query, Professor Kassler. Okay. In your opinion, uh, what do you think? The, what will be the role of biology in chemical engineering in future? The, the question is basically, where is chemical engineering going to be most effective in biology? And, and what has happened is there are two um, answers. The first is that we can look at using existing unit operations, crystallization, for example, uh, preparative chromatography. We can use those to purify drugs. Drugs do need to be very, very pure. Uh, and this is why one always seeks, if at all possible, to make the drug available as crystals. But the cost of processing drugs is a minor factor in the cost of making the drug. In other words, if I could improve, if I could cut the cost of separation, of drug separation in half by a better form of chromatography, that would not affect pricing of drugs except uh, for some large-scale generics. So the Factors that are so important, for example, for the manufacture of lubricants are simply not important for making drugs. What's, what's important is, is uh, deciding what you want to make. Now, the current effort in biotechnology, exemplified by the Nobel Prize winning work by Francis Arnold, is nominally chemical engineering is applied to drugs, but actually it's, it's well outside of our existing structure. We do not plan to teach that material our undergraduates, directed evolution. So I'm not sure, I, I don't argue at all that bioengineering does not make good sense, especially for our graduate students. But I'm not sure for the 90% of students who leave after a bachelor's degree that bioengineering is that useful. Okay? Okay, okay. And so, uh, there is a lot of dilemma in uh, right now in undergraduate education whether we should incorporate the subjects related to bio in the first year should give some knowledge of bio to our students or not what is your opinion with respect to this the idea of <laughs> making the idea of making undergraduate education as broad as possible early in the curriculum is very powerful. Um, so that to require biology in the first year may make excellent sense. To, to work on applications um, later in the curriculum, I think again, you have to say, where are the jobs? Yes. Um, if if you have a and india maybe is different india has in producing generics a very powerful and effective industry so i don't know how many engineers they'll need but i can see a stronger market in india than i can in the us uh, if you look not at biochemical engineering but biomedical engineering there i'm less sure but again I think you have to ask the question, where are you going to employ bachelor's level students? Okay. So, any question? Hello. Uh, Deepak, can I ask one question? Okay, 
I think uh, I'm allowed. I take this. Prof. Kassler, uh, good, good evening. Uh, so this is uh, this side is Ashwini Kumar Sarma. I am Deepak's colleague here in IIT Roorkee. And uh, yes, I had the pleasure of listening to you around five, seven years ago in uh, Singapore. And uh, uh, like the, similarly, like that lecture today also, I enjoyed your your lecture. Maybe it is it was slightly in different context. There you talked about mass transfer in chemical engineering. Uh, Prof. Farooq from uh, Singapore organized that lecture, if you remember. Prof. Farooq, uh, yes. So nice to hear you again. And uh, yes, uh, uh, when I see this uh, brightness on your uh, on your face when you are talking, I am also pleased as a as a uh, as a tutor or as a or as an instructor of chemical engineering. Uh, thanks for uh, guiding us uh, through this. And uh, yes, uh, so now regarding my question, I come to my question. Today I was one student was sitting with me here in my cabin, uh, and we were talking about uh, chemical engineering. So uh, this, uh, like the one problem that in India, especially when these uh, core branches, especially chemical engineering or other mechanical engineering, we face the student face is the, in the search of jobs. So as you see, India provides consultancy uh, for in terms of information technology to a lot of uh, firms in abroad as well. So the students in terms of uh, uh, job security, they are more inclined towards the computer science and engineering. They want to learn programming. They want to do all this uh, computer science stuff. So as a uh, chemical engineering educator, then it becomes a tough job more for me to keep them engaged in chemical engineering stuff. The same question, like uh, in the last uh, series, I had uh, discussed this with Prof. M. Uh, Sharma also. But again, the same question popped up to today in front of me with this uh, student. So, uh, would you like to say something in this regard? Maybe you can guide us, uh, the young educators. The, the question, if I can abbreviate what you've said, is. Uh, our enrollment is suffering because of competition with data science. How do we how do we reverse this trend? Is that fair? Yes, it, it, it is fair. It is fair. Okay. Um, if you were starting out. Would you still make, if I were starting out again, would I still make the decision to go after chemical engineering rather than data sciences? And, and the answer is, I would want something that has to do with chemistry. Because I think that having a, having the discrete nature of chemistry is a wonderful intellectual challenge. If, if I'm studying um, optics, I can have any wavelength of light I want. But if I'm studying band gaps, I'm stuck with what nature dictates. And so I would I would want to be in the part of science which has this discrete distribution. I think that's really fascinating. Now, would I also be interested in data science? The answer to that is also yes. And the jobs in data sciences are going to continue to explode. So. I don't know that we want to argue that we should take we should recruit students into chemical engineering instead of data sciences. I would rather look for opportunities to have both of those in the same subject. Does that make sense? I'm getting a uh, slight clue what you are trying to say that uh, in the chemical engineering we should try to explore the applications of data science yes okay yes yeah uh, so yeah. so uh, 
is like uh, then the question is like uh, because we have only uh, four years with the students so can we accommodate uh, like uh, like uh, both the things data science and chemical engineering it will be then uh, a tough job yes we what, can, what you what you're saying is uh, the curriculum is is already prescribed to a very large extent um how can we possibly add something else? And, and the answer, of course, is um, by cutting something. And, and right away, you, you have to look at um, what things would you cut? And I think the answer there is I would look to things that are perhaps most useful for the commodity chemical business. W one subject that I would reduce, and I suspect you've already done this in your faculty, uh, and certainly many departments have, is research and process control. I don't deny that that research is important or useful and shouldn't be practiced by a subgroup but I'm not sure that it should be required of all students. I would also look to uh, questions of catalysis. Uh, I think the fact that in the US, many academic, I'm sorry, many industrial programs have dramatically reduced their emphasis on catalysis should make us hesitate about major investments in undergraduate curriculum in catalysis. Um, I, I understand that reductions like this in order to include more data sciences will be and should be resisted. But I think the answer maybe is you want to choose your curriculum not so that it's the same as every other department, but so that it's different. What do you have that is different? Th thank, thank you, Prof. Kostler. Uh, like, uh, uh, I think I got the idea that uh, we need to look forward to a restructuring of our uh, uh, curriculum. In this in this regard, so that we can reignite the passion among the students, uh, we can bring some scent of uh, data science in our uh, original curriculum, and then things can be better. So I, I yeah I think uh, Professor Pratik wants to ask one question. So yeah, Professor Pratik, can you hear me? Can you? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yes. Professor, yeah. It's a very enjoyable talk. I really like uh, I would this entire talk, but uh, one of the things was about uh, uh, Socrates and uh, Kelvin. Uh, it was a very uh, good, good point. So I had a related question uh, that is about uh, the future of like uh, the lectures in general. So I would say like uh, it used to be that uh, students used to come in the lecture hall and they get new content by the educated uh, professors and all that. Now so much content is on the internet that uh, first of all we do not provide much new content and secondly students come with uh, I would say uh, preoccupied mindset that I am not getting anything new because everything is on the web. So what has happened over time is uh, we, although we try to uh, deliver our agenda, the students feel that much new is being delivered. So I think there has to be like a rethinking in terms of our uh, education system and how should we deliver content to our students. Uh, so, what is your opinion on that, uh, if my question is clear? Well, I, I agree with you um, completely, but once you and I would start to talk about details, 
we would disagree completely, which I think is correct. <laughs> I, I would hope that we do disagree uh, extensively. Um, we just have had a worldwide experiment on remote learning. I mean, COVID taking the professors out of the classroom has, has made us decide that in many first year courses, we probably can supplement those with, for example, MOOCs or, or other forms of electronic learning. But we also have this very strong reaction that at least in this country, I don't know that if it's tr is true for you, uh, that students are losing uh, an important part of their experience by not being face-to-face -face with faculty. And I'm very sorry I'm no longer teaching because I think on the one hand, there are chances to make combinations of this that would be better than either extreme. For example, when I am giving a large lecture, I always wanted students to think about the ideas. So I would often say, talk to the person next to you and graph, for example, flux versus concentration. Gra draw a graph, and then once you've drawn the graph, compare it with the person next to you. And that way, they become an active participant in their learning. And, and then if you can bring them back and say, okay, who disagreed with this? Uh, who agrees with it? Then you have the possibility of the Socratic in dialogue, which is what you should seek. Now, can you do this on a regular basis? I, I don't know. I, I thought that if you could, if you did have some of the lectures electronic and you then supplemented them with chat rooms, and then you had students come back to you, um, that would be really effective, it could be better than what we now do. Now, in the same sense, do you know about the flipped classrooms? Yes, I do. Yeah. Do, you, do you think? Yeah. Of, That's basically, I, I'll give an approximation for those that you who don't know about it. Um, you, you basically, you tape your lectures and you make the lectures available to all the students. Okay. And then what was the lecture now becomes a tutorial session to do the homework. Okay, so the whole thing is inverted. The time you spend with the students is on the homework and the time you spend on the ideas is on the tape, on the videotape. Uh, Nancy Lake, a professor at a small engineering college in Los Angeles, split her thermodynamics class and taught one, one half with flip, flip classroom and one half with a conventional classroom and then had exams at the end of it to see who had learned the most and who liked the most and so forth. And the likes and dislikes were about the same. But what was fascinating to me is that they'd learned about the same. Uh, and, and so that to me says, and thermodynamics, that's a hard subject. I mean, that, that's not fill in the blank by any means. Um, so so I, I really am not sure, um, but I think it's, it's a wonderful chance to experiment, isn't it? H have any of you used clickers? I, I never did this. It's a, yeah, actually, it's you not very common in India because like okay. 100 students in class. But yeah, I, mean, sir, yeah. I have used in the US. One of the, the yeah. yeah, you give every student a little toy, like a little yeah, whistle right. or something. Yeah. And you US say, do you understand this? 
and then you have them make the noise so that you can't really tell who doesn't understand it, who admits this. <laughs> but but in that way, you can you can force them to do something to respond to you rather than just write down the equation. Um, so I, I guess I think that a really positive outcome from COVID could be our examination of when we need a lecture. The answer is not always. The answer is also not never. <laughs> okay. So, oh, Professor Kassler, there is one question from a uh, uh, chat box by Dr. Ratan Deep R. Joshi that how about AR, VR, and MR with 3D plant designs for process optimization? I don't understand the question. But, uh, Uh, this is artificial reality, virtual reality uh -huh. with 3D plant design for process optimization. This is more deep into the subjects. So uh, they are asking that whether it will be applicable for teaching or not. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So actually, uh, there's another question from YouTube actually. Wait, stay, stay, stay with that a little more because um, how, how many new plants are being built? Virtually very less. But but in that case, um, to me, it says that that some students need that depth of understanding, but not all. The, the one thing that to, to, to grow on that, I, I've wondered if you have a dispersed energy source, if you have free electricity, basically, from wind, can, can you make a chemical plant that would supply herbicide? To, to farmers locally. And so make the agricultural chemical production local. Now, the advantage to that, I think, depends on the size. If, if you're gonna make fertilizer, I think that's really an interesting idea. Because if you could make your own fertilizer, if you make the fertilizer in a in a centralized location, then you have to ship it to where you want to use it. But if you're going to make, um, for example, a very specific pheromone for insect control, you're going to make so little that I think shipping cost is trivial. Yes. So, yes. And, and I haven't seen discussions about this, and I'm surprised. Maybe the answer is always big. In, in which case plant design will be important. But if you want to make, I mean, ener en renewable energy is the place to think, isn't it? Why can't you make farms um, energy self-sufficient? Okay, Professor Kasla, I think we got the idea and the thought behind that we should be thought. Yeah, you got the subject. thought, but but I didn't give you an answer. You understand that. I don't know the answer. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay. So I think we are done now. And uh, Professor Asas. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for a very nice discussion, Professor Tesla. So finally, we, will, we would like to conclude and I would like to invite Professor Veluswamy to deliver a vote of thanks. So, Professor, Professor Velu Velu Swamy. Swamy. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to all. Am I audible? Yes. It's a very great, a great honor and privilege to propose a word of thanks on this memorable occasion of the fourth edition of JBLAL, Prof. JBLAL Memorial Lecture Series. 
which was delivered by the most eminent personality in chemical engineering sphere, Professor Edward Kessler. Thank you, Professor, for gracing this occasion, despite the inconvenience of delivering the lecture at early morning due to the time zone difference. Of course, you have told you enjoyed, but for us, it might be a bit difficult. Your talk was inspiring and thought provoking. We'll try to ponder over the points what you have shared with us this evening. We feel really motivated and it indeed was a privilege to hear you this evening. I take this opportunity to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to our Honorable Director, Professor Ajit Chaturvedi, for his esteemed presence amongst us for presiding over this meeting. My heartfelt thanks to the head of the department, Professor Srivastav, organizing committee members, as well as all the faculty colleagues who have actively participated in this event and helped us in the successful conduct of this fourth edition of Professor J. Bilal Memorial Lecture. Thank you all. Finally, it importantly, I would like to thank our beloved audience for gracing this occasion and for their kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>